Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bible class today. Glad that you've joined us uh, either live or watching the recording of this uh, later. Uh, we're glad that you're with us today and just uh, I'm so pleased that we're able to, to still gather together and, and uh, share share God's word in this way. So um, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, thanks for participating in Bible class. We're going to be going through John uh, chapter 20 today. Uh, John chapter 20 is where we're going to look at uh, more of the second half of the, the chapter today. Um, this week and next week, we're going to be looking at the post-resurrection accounts from John's gospel. Uh, the week after that, we're going to jump over uh, and look at the two resurrection accounts from Mark and from Matthew. Those are a little shorter, so we're going to handle both those in one week. And then we're going to jump into um, looking at the resurrection accounts from Luke's gospel, which will take us up to the ascension. And then we'll jump over um, when we remember the ascension, uh, the, the timing with that as we go through uh, these days after Easter with Jesus. Uh, we'll jump over to the first chapter of Acts. And then uh, on Pentecost, we'll actually look at the Pentecost account. So that's the plan for the next six or seven weeks that we're going uh, to be studying here on Sunday mornings. We're going to be walking through uh, this post-Easter time with Jesus and his disciples experiencing some of the things they would have experienced as well. All right, so let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings of this life that you give to us. Or thank you that even though we are far away from each other, distant from one another, you are not distant from us. Thank you for this platform that we're able to come together uh, and study your word, uh, to learn, to grow, to be edified, to be strengthened and challenged for our lives as we follow you as your faithful disciples. Uh, just be with us today. Send us your spirit to, to guide us, to, to open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at, so if you could open your Bibles up to John chapter 20, that's where we're going to start. Um, we're just going to kind of skim through the first half of the, this section, the Easter account uh, in John's gospel, uh, in chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, we get the setting that's the first day of the week. Um, and so if you remember, uh, the first day of the week is Sunday. Um, that's true for us, just as it was true for the ancients. The first day of the week is Sunday, um, which leads up to the seventh day, the, the Shabbat, the, uh, the, the Sabbath, um, was the seventh day, was Saturday. Um, and so... It's now flipped from Saturday to Sunday. Jesus was crucified on Friday. That's day one. He spent Saturday in the tomb. Now it's day three. Um, it's Sunday. So although it was less than 48 hours, Jesus was uh, in the tomb or the tomb was sealed. Uh, it's parts of three days. And so it's uh, that's how the ancients figured the three days. That was part of what they talked about. So it's the first day of the week. Um, and... The first day of the week becomes known as the Lord's Day because it was on this day that Jesus rose from the dead. And so uh, John's saying on the first day of the week, on the Lord's Day, basically, uh, Mary goes to the tomb. And so um, this is the reason why as Christians, we, have, we worship not on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, but we worship now on Sunday, on the Lord's Day because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So every time that we gather together together for worship uh, on Sunday, it is a mini Easter. So whether it's Easter day or not, uh, when we gather together on Sunday, why we gather together on Sunday is to remember and celebrate um, and commemorate the Lord's resurrection. So every Sunday is a, a celebration of Easter. Okay, so Mary goes to the tomb. It's early in the morning, it's still dark. Um, and she gets to the tomb and she sees that the stone has been rolled away. Um, and so, um, she goes not really knowing or thinking how, who's going to roll the stone away. In other gospels, we hear and see that the women were talking about who would roll the stone away for them. Um, maybe they were going to try to sweet talk the, uh, the, uh, the, the chief priest guards to do that. Who knows? Um, but, uh, they're trying to figure that out. But when she gets there, the stone's been rolled away. Um, and so she goes and tells Peter. 
And Peter and John, uh, that's the disciple who Jesus loved. Uh, that's how he refers to himself in this gospel that he wrote. They run to the tomb. Um, John's faster, it seems. And so John gets there first. Um, we're, we're probably talking a distance of um, maybe a mile, uh, probably less than a mile, maybe a half mile, but it's through city streets. And so uh, John is, whether he's faster or not, he's more nimble and he gets there quick, more quickly. Um, so, uh, but Peter goes in first, even though John reached there first and they saw linen cloths, uh, they didn't go in. Uh, um, he saw linen cloths Then Simon Peter came bustling in. Uh, they saw the linen cloths, they saw the face cloth and it's all folded up neatly. It's not like it was a rush, like somebody just stole the body and unwrapped things as fast as they could. It's all folded up neatly in a place by itself. Um, John goes in and they don't understand, John tells us, that he and Peter don't get it. Um, they don't get that uh, he must rise from the dead. And the disciples, they go back home and they're wondering and they're pondering about these things. Um, Mary, it seems, um, Mary, it seems, ran back with Peter and John because she's still there again at the tomb. After they go back home, she's weeping and wondering what's happened, what's going on. She sees two angels in white. She asks them where they put Jesus. Uh, then Jesus appears to her. She thinks he's the gardener. She asks him. She doesn't recognize him. She doesn't see. Um, and then um, Jesus says her name, and then Mary sees Jesus clearly, um, and um, Mary goes and tells the disciples that she's seen the Lord. So that's kind of the, the review of the first 18 verses, but you get some of these things, some of these themes that are there. Uh, the biggest one in, in John's gospel is seeing is not believing, right? Um, you've maybe heard that phrase, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, that's not the theme of John's gospel. John's theme is actually the op opposite. Believing is seen. As you believe, as Christ re um, causes faith in your heart, then you can see clearly who he is and what he's done. So uh, seeing is not believing. Believing in John's gospel is seen. And so Mary sees Jesus, but she doesn't until he calls out to her then with the eyes of faith, she can see him clearly. Uh, and we're going to see that over and over again throughout this um, John's gospel. A scene is not believing, believing is seen. So I just want to show you a few uh, kind of pictures and things as we get going. Um, I'm going to just, there's a great diagram in um, the Lutheran Study Bible. I'm going to hold that up for you there. Um, get that front there. This is of the kind of burial tomb. Um, you can see the, uh, the benches that are there, the kind of two people sitting on them. You see somebody stooping down to get in to the burial chamber. There would have been three or four benches that were along the wall. Uh, and then you see those little uh, niches there, those cokes, they call them. Uh, those were where after your body had decomposed, the flesh part was gone. Uh, they would gather your bones together and put them in those niches, uh, or they would put them in a box um, and they would put that into, uh, thanks Gail, or, and they would put that into a um, box called an ossuary and they'd put that inside one of those niches as well. So that's what a diagram of is. So you can see the, the, the benches on either side. Um, let me show you just a couple of uh, pictures then of what these look like in uh, kind of real life here. So I think I showed these uh, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Lazarus's tomb. So this is uh, kind of one of those burial chambers. This one doesn't have the niches in it. Uh, it just has the benches along the walls. Here's another angle. You can see the bench there and there. Um, the side, the right side, the bench on either side there. Um, yeah, so that just kind of gives you a glimpse of that. And, and let me just show you the, another picture of, um, this is, um, uh, I think I shared this one. I don't know which, which Bible class it's in. We were driving along the highway. We actually took this specific route because he wanted to show us an example of a tomb with a, 
stone right there um, that you was going by as you could uh, you see that stone and and so you can see uh, with if you uh, reference the height of the guardrail you can see that you would have to um, really crouch down or even get onto your knees to kind of crawl into this tomb. Some of them had a little higher uh, entryways, but but most of them, they were not large entryways to get in. Um, you were getting down, uh, maybe on all fours, at least crouching down uh, to kind of uh, get into the tomb, and then you would either drag the body in somehow and, and put that in. Probably uh, two people would be doing that. I've not seen that, so I don't know exactly how they did that. But they would put that in and arrange the body in the tomb um, on one of those benches. And, and so that uh, maybe gives you a little more insight of what that might look like. Um, that uh, stone that could be rolled in front of that, um, probably to keep odor out, but also probably to uh, keep odor in, I should say, but also probably to keep animals and other things out uh, of those tombs. Um, and so they would, it would have a family tomb and you would ha maybe have um, two or three of your family members that would be on that bench, depending on those benches in those. Uh, some of the uh, tomb structures that I was able to go in, they had not just one chamber like you saw, they had three or four chambers like that. Um, and, and so then they would um, maybe have more room for people to, to, to be laid out. Um, and then after people had, um, like I said, decomposed, their bones would be gathered together. And so there's a phrase in scripture in some places and uh, that's talked about being gathered to the bones of your fathers. Um, that was not just a euphemism. That was a literal thing that happened. As uh, before, you know, the ossuaries, those bone boxes you've maybe heard about, um, those were mostly in the first century. Um, but before that, they just, they literally just gathered your bones and, and put them into the bone pile with the rest of your relatives. Um, this was the way that they honored and, and buried their dead. This was uh, a good and proper way to do that. All right, any questions about the burial customs, about the burial chamber itself? about any of those things um yeah with with jesus and, and that account the tomb All right seeing none if you got any feel free to type in the comment or jump in and unmute yourself and jump in seeing that we're gonna kind of move on here um yes Patty? <clears throat> Um, I, maybe you're going to say something about this, but I remembered a while ago being shown a, a devotional about why the napkin was folded and the significance of that. That in he, I think I tried I looked it up just a minute ago, but in Hebrew traditions, the servants would set the table like they were supposed to, just exactly like the master wanted it, and they wouldn't dare touch his plate until he was finished. And if he stood up, wipe, if he was finished, he would wipe his hands, wipe his beard, and just toss the napkin on the table, which meant I'm finished. But if he was just walking away, he would fold it and lay it back down. And that meant I'm coming back. Interesting. Yeah. And, and so that's what a, a good message for us, too, that it, it's folded. It's, it's intentional. It wasn't just uh, heaped up somewhere. Thanks, Patty, for sharing that. All right. Um, yeah, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Remember, this was a new tomb. Um, this is a tomb where no other bones had been gathered or buried. Um, and so that's there. Yeah, the Millers? Yes, sir. I was just, uh, and maybe you're going to get to this, um, but the actual tomb is known to exist, and that's believed to be at the Holy Sepulchre uh, location. You may have some pictures from your travels of, from that and it's also difficult to get into right yeah so the uh um i i didn't show any pictures of the holy sepulcher jim yeah you're right there's there are two um two kind of spots where the burial of jesus is remembered uh, one of them is uh the church of the holy sepulcher 
I think is is probably uh, more accurate historically um, than the other. Um, but it, it doesn't look like a tomb anymore. <laughs> um, it it has a, a big old uh, kind of church like structure, um, very orthodox, um, gaudy by my tastes um, structure that's uh, put around the whole thing with with candles and. Uh, incense and, and all these kinds of things. Um, that is most likely, and I think historically has has the most uh, truth to to where Jesus would have been buried. Um, and, and so you do kind of, uh, they built a, a church around it and they built a church around that. And, and it's just a, a magnificent structure, but it's it's not very, you know, that, tomb, that picture I showed you of the tomb with the stone is what we all think of, right? It's not anything like that. And so you walk into this little kind of church-like thing. You walk down a few stairs and then with candles and everything else around it, it's just a hard bedrock slab is all that's left of the tomb. Um, the, uh, the tomb existed in maybe different ways or over the, the history over, uh, over time. Um, back in the, so after, in the early days after the resurrection, um, tradition tells us that the disciples of Jesus, the, the followers of the way, um, this is outside of scripture, but they tell us that they met at this tomb of Jesus every week, uh, sometimes even daily, um, to remember the resurrection of Jesus. Um, you know, when we have our resurrection eggs, we say, hey, look, the last egg, it's empty, right? There's nothing in it because Jesus is empty and the tomb is empty. Well, the first followers of Jesus in Jerusalem they met at the tomb every week and said, hey, it's empty. He's alive. He's not here. Uh, and that continues on for a, a long period of time when um, Rome destroys Jerusalem um, in 70 AD. Um, we're not sure about the history and the practice, but we see that uh, we believe that Christians still did that. Hadrian, if you remember Emperor Hadrian, he built Hadrian's Wall in England, all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the Roman Empire emperor. He builds a, a statue and a temple to a Greek god on the site where the tomb is today. The Holy Se Church of the Holy Sepulchre is today. So he does one on the Temple Mount. He builds a temple to a Greek god, and he does one in this location. Why else would you do that if you weren't trying to supplant worship that's already going on? We get why he would do it on the Temple Mount. Well, why in this location? Well, that's where the Christians were remembering Jesus being born. So he's trying to, or being, being buried and risen. So, um, so that there, um, when uh, Constantine's mom comes through the Holy Land uh, in the 300s and is trying to find all these holy sites, uh, she's the one that says this is the place um, based on the history of, based on asking everyone else around. Um, and it's where this uh, same temple, you know, had been. Um, and she then turns it into kind of the first church of the Holy Sepulcher. Um, and so that's where the site is remembered. Um, it was outside the city wall on Jesus day. By the time that uh, Helena comes along and does this, it's now inside the city walls of Jerusalem uh, And the church of the Holy Sepulcher houses, both uh, the chapel, uh, the chapels that are at Calvary. Um, and then in the nearby garden tomb, um, there is a, um, this is where the, the tomb is remembered. So sorry for the long-winded answer. Why it's not a tomb today is in the um, in the 10th, 11th century, 12th century, I can't remember when, um, one of the Turkish emperors, Muslim emperors, uh, took a, an ax to the tomb and really destroyed most of it. Um, was not the only reason that King Richard got on its horse on his horse but was a contributing factor to the first crusade um, does not uh, excuse any of the things the crusaders did. Um, but that was one of the, um, one of the things that got um, King Richard and others. So fired up was the desecration of the tomb. Uh, most of the time by most parties, uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, um, holy sites were respected and were not desecrated. Um, this was one of the few times uh, that that actually happened from people on any side. And it doesn't mean that the Christians never did that to other sites or the Jews didn't do it to other sites, but 
most of the time, most, uh, almost everybody respected holy sites and they still do today. Um, um, but uh, this was one instance where it wasn't and it caused, um, at least in part, uh, the launching of the first crusade. So, um, so that's why it doesn't look like a tomb today, a cave. Now there's the garden tomb, which is outside of the, the old city limits today, which is much more romantic and, and looks much more like um, that, that picture I showed you and everything else. It's a picturesque garden and those things. It's much more romantic to remember the burial of Jesus and his resurrection, um, but probably not as authentic of location. All right. Yeah. So, so yeah, the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, and Tom Ray, if he was on, could tell you much more. Uh, he could probably go on for like three hours about it because there's that much to tell about it. Um, but the keys to the sepulchre, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's actually um, owned by a Muslim family, and they open it up for the Christians every day to so they can go in and do their stuff in there. So kind of an interesting way of just trying to how everybody gets along and makes it work. So, all right. Um and, and there's way deeper about that. If you want to know more, talk to Tom Ray. He's he's a wealth of knowledge on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. All right. Um, yeah, the Christians don't necessarily agree on every, if there's like uh, six or seven different uh, Christian groups that all have part of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And for them to do anything, they all have to agree. Um, and so there's uh, to symbolize that there's a ladder that sits outside um, uh, outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that's just sitting there because they can't agree if they can move it or not. Um, now that was true for a long time, but now it's just a symbol of that agreement and, and things that are there. All right. So that's there. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, uh, before we jump back into scripture, uh, at John 20, 19. Find a couple pictures of the sepulcher too. We'll see. Right. Can somebody read for us John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23? On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. All right, thank you very much. Um, so as we, we look at and, and think about this passage, again, um, it's the, the evening of that day, the first day of the week. So this is put uh, in that it's Sunday evening. The, the time hasn't elapsed or passed. So we've got the disciples, John and, and um, Peter, run to the tomb, and they, uh, they uh, go back. They're wondering. They're in disbelief. They don't know what's going on or why. Um, and so they're stewing on that all day long. Because remember, Mary goes at dawn um, before the sun's even completely up. And, and so, um, yeah, that that uh, they're stewing on that all day long. And, and the doors are locked because they're afraid of the Jews. They're afraid of um, what the Jews might do, right? They've killed Jesus, um, and now they are afraid that they're going to come and make a clean um, a clean job of it and, and kill the disciples too. Um, and so they're hiding. They are in this room. Everything's locked. They're shut up. Um, they're just trying to bide their time and, and get through that. They're afraid. On top of this, they're wondering, well, maybe the maybe the, they think we've stolen the body, so they're going to come in and hunt after us. Um, and, and so there's, uh, they're afraid. Um, they're afraid that um, their lives are in danger. Um, and, and then we get this awesome thing where the doors are being locked. And what does Jesus do? Locks don't stop Jesus. Jesus appears in the midst of the room with them. Um, now, I've, um, I've heard some folks say, well, 
Well, because Jesus, you know, and, and this is the same reason that some folks use to deny the real presence is, well, Jesus' body can't do go through physical walls. He's, that's his human nature. It can't do that. Well, according to his divine nature, his human body can do all of that too, because he's God. And so uh, he can be with us in the Lord's Supper, physically present for us. His body can physically enter into a locked room. It doesn't have to like some people said, hey, look, he, op he opened a window and came in the window and ta-da, I'm right here. Well, that's not what the text is reading. The, the whole house is shut up. There is no way to gain entry uh, unless it's by force. But yet Jesus just appears in the midst of them, not just in spirit, but in flesh and blood as well. And so Jesus is physically present uh, with them, uh, that he has power, his body, his uh his divine nature, all of those things to, to go into a locked room. Locks don't keep Jesus out um, in the midst of that. And so, um, yeah, so, and then Jesus says to them, peace be with you. Um, the Greek word is arene, uh, which is always uh, how the word shalom, uh, the word peace in the Old Testament is translated, Ron, if that answers your question. So probably it would have been some form of the word shalom, which just doesn't mean like peace, like, hey, peace, guys, hey, peace, you know. No, it means absence of fear. It, it means um, you don't have to worry about anything, that, that life is good and life is right. I got some uh, comments and questions. Joe, you, you had a, a comment? Yeah, the the, uh, the doubt of the of Jesus' ability to enter a completely closed room, you know, um, you know, being Christian, we believe he's fully God and fully man. If he wasn't fully God and fully man, he wouldn't be able to walk on water, um, uh, raise Lazarus from the dead, yet feel the emotion and sadness that he that Lazarus Lazarus had passed. Right. Yeah, and, and according, he does all of that. He does all of that with his divine and human nature. Some things he does according to his divine nature, but his human nature still participates. Some things he does according to his human nature, dying for one, but his divine nature still participates. So God died on the cross and a man walked on water and a man entered a locked room uh, without having to open a door or a window. Uh, Jesus is the God man. He is unique in this. But that allows him to do those things um, in the midst of all of that. Yeah, thanks for that, Joe, for just uh, uh, jumping in on that comment and, and clarifying those things and, and adding to that. That's really good. Um, yeah, this is the first self-quarantine lockdown, but I think they were doing that for what they were trying to social distance from each other. I think just from the, the Jewish leaders. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Mom. Um, and in the midst of, of all of that. Um, but, yeah, peace. Shalom. Um and then notice what Jesus does. He says, here's my hands. Here's my side. You know, here are the wounds. I am the same guy. This is me, right? They see him, but they don't believe. Not yet. And then, so what does he sell him again? He repeats his greeting. Peace be with you as the... Um, as the Father sent me, even so I send you. And as he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus breathes on them. He gives them the Holy Spirit. They have faith now to believe. And it's only now that they can really see. Um, it's not seen as believing. For the disciples, it's believing being that gift, giving that gift of Jesus' word to them, that peace to them, um, the Holy Spirit that comes through that word that then allows them to see. Believing is seeing. Um, and so they, uh, this is, uh, in some senses, John doesn't talk about Pentecost. This is his Pentecost here where Jesus breathes on them uh, and they receive the Holy Spirit. This is uh, John saying they are, uh, commissioned by Jesus. They're ready to go. Um, this is also his great commission <laughs> in John. It's not um, go and make disciples, but it, it's um, I'm sending you. And his message that he's sending them with is forgiveness. The message uh, uh, is 
to forgive. Uh, and what a, what kind of a, you know, I'm sending you just as I was sent. Now go and give forgiveness, give mercy, give grace, give peace to other people. All right. So let's just uh, um, stop there for a second um, and just uh, kind of talk about and discuss a little bit. How does God continue to share his peace with us? And, and how does he do that over and over again? Right. He shares the peace of his peace with the disciples and he says it twice to them immediately. How does God share his peace with us and how does he do that uh, continually over and over again? Any any thoughts, comments, questions? Go ahead, Pastor Kirk. Well, one of the things I was thinking about already was when you and Pastor Schultz come out and say, the Lord be with you. And we respond and also with you. Yeah. Lately, lately, because we are doing this virtual worship, uh, I hear people in the background responding, but we do respond as well. And I want you and Pastor Schultz to know that, that I appreciate that even as a pastor retired now, I appreciate those words more perhaps now than I perhaps have in the past. And then the other thing I would ask about is, uh, how are we going to share the sign of peace after we get back together? That's a great question, Pastor Kirk, that I don't have the answer to at this point. <laughs> uh, some people are telling us we shouldn't ever shake hands with anyone ever again. Um, but if you uh, if you go back, they the the sign of the peace that we shared currently before this of the, the shaking of the hands had changed from how they did it back in biblical times, right? They shared a holy kiss and that's not how we share it now. So that custom has changed. Um, and so if, if we have to, or need to change that custom, we'll figure out a way to share the peace uh, even in, in these times and, and to keep us safe and to, to May be called. Uh, maybe we um, even if that has to change, that has to change. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Jim. Maybe we could all make the sign of the cross towards each other. Just a possibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think there's uh, there's room, I think, for creativity, depending on what we need to do or have to do in this time. So, yeah. And it's possible that uh, that may, you know, not doing that. You know, who knows? There's, there's lots of possibilities on that. All right. Uh, other thoughts or questions of how... Um, God continues to share peace with us and that he does it over and over again. Thoughts, questions, comments. Go ahead, Jim or I Sheila. Was, I was thinking that his words in the Bible, we can always just go to the Bible and, and you know, look at scripture. Yeah, yeah God, God's word. Based on what, what she just said, then it doesn't say in John uh, 20, that he shook all of the apostles' hands. It said, <laughs> the future won't just be us saying to one another with a mask on or without at some point. Let's be with you. You don't have to shake hands. That's a yeah. man. We, we probably won't breathe on each other, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, the yeah, other thoughts are, yeah, right. It's it's that word of peace, isn't it? Um and, and that word of peace that we can give to each other, you know, uh, you know, peace of the Lord be with you. God's peace be with you. We can share that with others uh, and do that in a different way. Uh, how else do we receive God's peace? I think the ongoing feeling of uh realizing through Christ we are in the realm of God's love and separated from condemnation. Yeah, just uh, that real realization, that reality, and hearing that again of, of what God's done for us. I see a couple of different comments that talk about um, communion, the Lord's Supper, what God gives to us in the, in the, the sacrament, um, you know, that that physical, tangible reminder of God's presence. Uh, and all of these things that we're talking about, they're not just one-time things. He, he does them over and over and over again for us. Um, that God continually pronounces his peace uh, to you and to me. Um, just as he needed to with the disciples, um, he gives us that word so that we can believe. And as we believe, we then can see Jesus clearly 
and know the peace that he has for us. Um, whether that's through reading promises in his word, whether that's through the Lord's Supper, whether that's through the, uh, the words of our pastors or other Christians as they speak that peace to us, um, whether that's through, um, you know, um, all, all, any of those other gifts that we were talking about, um, the blessings um, that God gives that, they, they fill us up. Um, they, in, in God's life, and yeah, uh, music. Yeah, another, another way that that happens as those words and prayer yeah, thanks, guys. You guys are awesome with that. So um, some of those comments that are coming through, um, prayer and music, and, and they fill us up spiritually. Um, reading God's word, hearing it spoken to us, receiving the words of the absolution, uh, the words of the benediction, all of those ways. God gives us his grace all of the time in worship and then outside of that as well to lift us up and build us up. Okay, so shifting gears then, um, yeah, in our baptism. Uh, in the midst of that too. Thanks, Abigail. Um, the Talking about the mission that Jesus sends the disciples on, it, it's a mission of forgiveness. Why is the job of forgiveness or the pronouncement of forgiveness, why is that the mission of the church? Why would that be what Jesus tells the disciples there to do, is to forgive and withhold forgiveness of the unrepentant, right? I don't want to just say, oh, we forgive, just whatever, but it's those that are repentant, those that are uh, in sorrow for their sins and seeking restoration. Why is that the church's job to forgive? Why, why is that how Jesus here, uh, John records Jesus saying, this is what you're to do? The reason Jesus came to bring forgiveness is... Uh, what the, the Beckers say, and we now have the same mission um, to, to forgive. Yeah. Wasn't sure if that was my mom or my dad. That was dad. Okay, good. All right. Other thoughts? It's part of that great commission. Yeah, just go and make disciples, teaching them, baptizing them. Um, it, it summarizes it maybe in a different way, that, that, that aspect of our relationship or being right with God. Um, yeah, Abigail, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it, it, it's, it's justification, it's mercy, and it's grace all at the same time, because once we're forgiven, it's just as if we had never sinned, and we are receiving, I mean, that's mercy, that's, you know, we're not getting something that we should have gotten which is, you know, eternal damnation. And then there's, there's grace where we're now we're receiving something that we don't even deserve. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the, it's another way to look at, you know, thanks for that. Another way to look at justification, another way to look at uh, the mission of Jesus of how he forgives us and what he does for us is forgiveness. And when we have that forgiveness, when that relationship is restored, uh, we move forward with the rest of our life then too, and living the way that we want to. Hey, we were thinking the same word there, uh, Denise, uh, restoration, or maybe that was Nathan, right? Um, uh, going back to the fall, um, God putting it back together again. That's forgiveness. It's being made right with God. Um, but I like that John uh, uses, you know, kind of sets out that this is what you guys are to do. You are to forgive um, in, in the midst of all of that. Yeah, sin separates, forgiveness unites. Uh, what's another comment? Thanks, Gail, for that. All right. And so uh, I did talk about, and, and Jesus talks about here, uh, forgive the sins of the repentant, um, but withhold forgiveness from any of the unrepentant. That's, you kind of get more in John's gospel that way. Um, it's not just whoever you feel like you shouldn't forgive. It's no, if, if people aren't repentant, if they don't see a need, if they don't believe they're sinners, if they don't desire that, if they don't desire to live the way God wants them to, um, we shouldn't say, yeah, it's okay. It doesn't matter how you live because God loves to forgive you. So you're okay. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is saying that thing that's broken you, that thing that's torn apart your relationship with God, that you are grieving over, that you are struggling with, that you want to change and aren't sure how to fix it. That now is restored. Not that thing that you're like, whatever, it doesn't matter what I do because I love to sin and God loves to forgive. That's not the kind of a cheap grace we're talking about. 
we're talking about uh, grace, forgiveness that's given and won through the extreme cost of Jesus Christ on the cross. It wasn't cheap to buy our forgiveness. And, and so we don't want to throw it out there. And this is where the Bible uses the phrase like pearls before swine uh, to give a huge, great gift and have people to see it as something common or worthless or not there. So that's why Jesus has both forgive and withhold forgiveness. Um, you know, it's not that I'm you know, not as we, the church are trying to Lord it over people. I'm not going to forgive you, but no, God desires for, to forgive you. He already has won your forgiveness. Um, but if we're not thinking we need it or desiring it, we shouldn't, we're not to pronounce that to people in that way. Any questions, comments on that? Well, let's go on. Um, can somebody read for us John 20, verses 24 through 29? John 20, 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. I cut you off a little early. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, so we get the setting again. It's, it's eight days later, um, which um, we'd say, well, now it's the Monday of the next week, but it's like, uh, no, they actually, when they're counting it, they're counting the, first day would, would be Sunday, and then you get seven more days till you get to the next Sunday. And so eight days later is, um, that's, um, that's an idiom basically for one week later. So the next Sunday, they're gathered together um, for eight days later. So Thomas isn't with them. We find out after the fact, the disciples are fulfilling this commission Jesus has given them to send them to others. They tell Thomas, Thomas is like, no way. I have to see to believe, is what Thomas says. And, and so, and, and I have to even touch to believe. I need the physical uh, presence of Jesus so that I can believe. Um, I need to um, see the, the mark in his hands and place my finger into the mark of the nails and, and place my hand into his side and I will never believe. Um, that place my hand in his side and place my finger in the nails, that, that's like a, a digital exam. That's like he wants to thrust his finger inside and feel around. It's that descriptive and graphic of a term, um, um, kind of more of like a medical term that, that Thomas is saying. So Thomas is, is being graphic in his words there. And so eight days later, it's a whole week. And can you imagine just that week for Thomas and the disciples where the disciples have seen Jesus they're excited, they're joyful, and yet Thomas thinks, well, who knows what Thomas thinks? Are they trying to pull a prank on him? If so, Thomas doesn't think it's very funny. Um, it's awkward because they want to be joyful and celebrate, and Thomas is kind of not and doesn't get it or doesn't you know, believe. And so there's this tension there that would be there that, uh, that first week. And maybe you've experienced some of that tension in your family where – you believe, but maybe someone else in your family or close circle doesn't. And, and that tension that can exist of what the resurrection means for us as Easter people versus someone who doesn't believe or hold on to the message of Jesus. And that tension can be difficult and tough. And I think maybe if you've experienced that, uh, uh, whether it's with your family or with friends or in work circles, um, maybe that's a, 
similar to what that would have been like that first week for those disciples uh, and the difficulty that Thomas would have felt and, and, and maybe you can put yourself into their situation a little bit. So they come through the door. The doors are again locked. Uh, we don't hear that they're afraid, but uh, they're still, the doors are still locked. And Jesus comes again and says, peace be with you. Again, offers that message of peace, shalom to all the disciples. And then he turns to Thomas. Um, and turns to Thomas and tells Thomas, doesn't wait for Thomas to ask. He says, Thomas, put your hand here. Put your finger into my side. Stop disbelieving and believe. Uh, and so you get that idea, that, that sense that's there. Um, you know, he wouldn't believe because he needed to see. But then we aren't told that Thomas actually needs to do any of those things that he said he wanted to do. At, at the word of Jesus, he now believes. He says, my, you know, my Lord and my God, you know, uh, he believes. And because he believes, he can see Jesus. Uh, and that's how it works for us. And Jesus says, you've believed because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, right? And so that blessing there for us. Uh, Thomas gets a bad rap. Um, I know Tom Ruff is on. So Tom, uh, Thomas gets a bad rap and is called Doubting Thomas. You've probably been called that before anytime you didn't believe something, Tom. Um, but uh, I think Thomas gets a really bad rap because all of the disciples needed what Jesus showed them. He needed them to him to give them faith from Mary to the disciples and, and to, to us. We need faith to believe, then we can see. Um, and so, uh, Thomas, I, I think we shouldn't call doubting Thomas, uh, um, but maybe believing Thomas, because that's what he does, and he confesses. And, and Thomas then goes on, not that we learn from scriptures, but from church history, uh, to go to, to Parthia in India. Thomas goes east, uh, and he makes it as far as India, uh, where he plants churches and confesses his faith boldly and clearly, so much so that, um, um, that uh, he excited the rage of pagan priests there, and church tradition tells us that Thomas was thrust through with the spear and killed for his faith, uh, but not before making a huge impact in the people in India, uh, so much so that there are still remnants of churches that um, of faithful believers that can trace their belief all the way back to Thomas uh, that's there. I had a friend from India who was named Thomas after, um, uh, as he was going to study at the seminary, he named Thomas after the apostle. Um, so Thomas is not doubting Thomas. Thomas is believing and confessing Thomas, uh, I think is a much better uh, thing to think about. Um, so that's uh, very faithful um, in the midst of all of that. Um, just catching up on the, the comments here. Um, yeah. So yeah, Jim, there's probably, you're right. Just uh, this fear of what are others going to believe? Thomas was with us and he doesn't even believe us. Are other people going to believe us if we tell them? Um, um, yeah. Thomas, uh, Jesus knows what Thomas said without Thomas, without the disciples having to share that with him. Jesus again shows his divinity by knowing what Thomas was saying and thinking and feeling and Jesus addresses that fear and that doubt directly. Um, and, and so Thomas, in the midst of that, was very faithful, too. Uh, just like all of the disciples, uh, all of them, uh, all the apostles, uh, except for John, uh, suffered a martyr's death. Uh, John did experience persecution. He was exiled. A church tradition tells us that he was tried to, they tried to kill him on at least one occasion, if not several um, but John was the only one that seems to have died of natural causes. Um, yeah. So uh, in that, uh, you know, as uh, missionaries uh, go to different parts of the world, they would continue to follow in the footsteps of the apostles as we go to known parts of the world uh, in that. And our missionaries uh, have been in India now for a hundred years from our church body. Thanks for pointing that out. So that's really cool. Yeah. So, um, Yeah. So just looking forward. So Jesus ends that with a blessing of, how, of, you know, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. 
Um, how do you find joy and comfort in that blessing of Jesus? Yeah, where God comes to us in a, in a powerful and meaningful way, uh, Judy and Ed, as you comment there, just uh, um, to give us that some type of Thomas moment um, in a special way that, that God works and reveals through the, the events in our lives or through a person in our life to explain something or to, to help open our eyes with the eyes of faith so we can see them. Yeah. How else does God, how do you find joy and comfort in the blessing knowing that uh, Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen uh, and yet believe. Yeah, it, it is us. Um, it, it is us who are the fulfillment of this promise. And to know that Jesus has us in mind when he says this. Uh, what a comforting thing to know that Jesus was already thinking of you, even as he's with his disciples, um, and knows that you are the fulfillment of this prophecy. He could already see your belief, uh, even though you had not seen him. Yeah. Any other thoughts or, or comments? Well, let's, uh, then let's finish up with uh, the last two verses of this chapter, 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life and his name. And, and so uh, as we, we think and look at that, uh, John wrote the things down that he did. John wrote his book. We're given the purpose of it. He wrote down everything that he wrote down so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's why he wrote down what he did. Did Jesus do other miracles that aren't written down in John's gospel? Yeah, we know about some of them from other books of the Bible, uh, from some of the other gospels. Did did Jesus say other things that aren't written down in any of the, yeah, yeah, Jesus said and did so many things, but the ones that John wrote down and the way John wrote them down, he wrote down with the express purpose so that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that through that belief, you may have everlasting life, life in his name. That's why John wrote down what he did. Um, um, and so through that belief, we are saved. Um, we get life, a life now with peace and hope and comfort and forgiveness with God, but life forever with Jesus. So, um, so it, you know, kind of just as you think about that, I, I was like, well, what would I want to be written down that John didn't include? You know, like, you know, John, John wrote down what we needed, but maybe there's some things you would want written down. Um, I think about like, I'd kind of want an exhausted list of miracles, you know, that would be there. Or um, I'd want uh, more details on what happened when we die or, or some of those things. Um, but John wrote down so that we could believe, um, you know, and so you may think of, have those other lists of things like when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this, right? Well, John might've known that or experienced that with Jesus, but he wrote down the things we needed. Um, so that we could believe and, and so that we could see. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. And that's uh, true for all of us, too. And, and Abigail, just the, the thought there of the Old Testament believers, too, um, that believe in God and that um, trusted in the promise of the Messiah without seeing Jesus, without seeing that fulfilled, that is that that was what was saving for them, too. They trusted in the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. They didn't get that revealed to them specifically who Jesus was, but they believed in that promise. They saw with the eyes of faith, they believed, and because they believed, they could see. Uh, true for the Old Testament believers, true for us too. Um, yeah, Jim, what made Jesus laugh? I, I would love to, to know that. In my office at church, I got hanging uh, on my wall a, a depiction of Jesus laughing. Um, and, and what made him laugh? Was it the, you know, you know, stories of Jesus laughing would be great. I'd love to have those included in scripture. Um, 
Jesus laughed. He was like the rest of us. But what would it that made him laugh? Well, we, we aren't told any specific stories that way. Um, and I'd love to, to hear that too. So, yeah. So just uh, as we, as we kind of close today, as we think about uh, that, we continue, as Sylvia says there, that to need the Holy Spirit as he comes to us to open our hearts. Um, that Holy Spirit given to us in baptism uh, is the one who continues to be present with us. We hear God's word. The Holy Spirit is working. As we um, are a comfort to others, the Holy Spirit is working. As we um, share that love and that mercy, that peace, that word of encouragement with others, the Holy Spirit's working in us to cause us to believe so that we can see Jesus, see how he still is active and working for us today, um, giving us peace, even in the midst of these times, uh, which are difficult and hard. Uh, the Lord gives you peace. All right. Any other thoughts or comments today as we close? All right, well, let's go ahead and close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us peace, peace that comes through your word, peace that comes through the forgiveness of sins that is proclaimed to us uh, through our church by our pastors, peace that comes to us um, through the love and the, the, the care of other Christians. Lord, we just ask that uh, this peace would permeate us as you speak it to us over and over again. And Lord, help us now as the disciples were sent uh, to be sent to carry this peace to others, uh, to carry this message of love and forgiveness and salvation that we may believe and trust in Jesus um, and that by believing in him, have life in his name, not just life eternally in heaven someday, but eternal life that began in our baptisms and continue through our deaths into heaven and the resurrection and the life eternal. Lord, help us with that knowledge, with that grace to live uh, with those that have peace now, bringing peace to those around us, a peace that comes through Jesus, peace that comes that no matter what happens in this life, we are secure in you. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You'll have a great week. Uh, we're studying the book of Ruth on Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. You can uh, be part of that in the same way, but I also put the recording up of that later on during the day. Um, and so glad to have all of you with us today. Have a, a great after, a great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your week. We'll be back next week.